I want to begin by thanking our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible. I would also like to acknowledge our university and community supporters. The University of Iowa's Honors Program, the UI Public Policy Center, UI International Programs, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their continued financial support. Uh, we're also very grateful to today's special sponsors, Allison Ken Atkinson, Mason and Kay Braverman, and Green State Credit Union. Uh, also thanks to City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2, and the University of Iowa Libraries Digital Archives. And it's my pleasure at this time uh, to introduce Jim Olson, who will be introducing our speaker today. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> it's my, my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our speaker, Deborah Dela. My name is Jim Olson. I am the president of the Johnson County chapter of the United Nations Association of the USA. And on behalf of our chapter, I'd like to thank the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council and the sponsors of today's event. Uh, we have been in partnership with the ICFR See for several years to sponsor an event close to United Nations Day, October 24th, to observe that event. And we're very pleased that we're able to continue that partnership this year. The mission of the United Nations Association is to inform Iowans about, well, all Americans, but here in Iowa, Iowans and citizens and residents of Johnson County about the work of the United Nations and to build support for a constructive partnership between the United States and the United Nations. And uh, without going into more detail, I will just point out that the partnership between the United States and the UN is somewhat weakened at the present time, and so we feel that our work is more important than ever. Our UNA chapter here in Johnson County is affiliated with the statewide Iowa United Nations Association, of which Deborah is the executive director. There are several members and leaders of both the Johnson County chapter and the Iowa UNA in the audience today. And I wonder if, if those of you who are members and leaders of UNA could uh, just wave your hand. So there are lots of us here. Thank you for being here. Those of you who did not wave your hand are, are cordially invited to consider membership in our organization. And I have uh, put these cards on the table, and uh, they give more information about our work and uh, the process by which you can become a member. We are one, actually, of two chapters of UNA in Johnson County. The other is a student-based chapter on the University of Iowa campus. And for those of you who are students at the university, uh, you have a special opportunity to be a member of that group, and Deborah or I can provide you more information about that. So Deborah Dela is both a professor at Drake University and the executive director of the statewide Iowa UN Association. She holds an undergraduate degree from Miami University of Ohio, and a PhD from the University of Notre Dame. She's been a faculty member at Drake since 1995, and is currently the David G. Maxwell Distinguished Professor of International Affairs. She teaches courses on the United Nations, international law, global gender issues, global migration, and global health. She is the author of three books on human rights, global health, and U.S. immigration policy. So the Iowa UNA, as you can see, is extremely fortunate to have such a knowledgeable and accomplished person serving as its executive director. So let's welcome Deborah, and uh, we very much look forward to your presentation today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I want to start by thanking the Iowa City Council, on, Foreign Relations Council, and the Johnson County Chapter of the United Nations Association for co-sponsoring this event. I want to thank all of you for being here. 
And as Jim's introduction suggests, I'm here today with a blended perspective. On the one hand, I'm a faculty member in international relations, and we are trained to sort of bring a critical eye to all of the institutions that we study. So I have those perspectives. And I'm also here wearing the hat of executive director of the Iowa United Nations Association, which advocates on behalf of uh, the UN's priorities and for constructive US global engagement. And so I'm gonna be wearing both of these hats, bringing together an advocacy lens and a critical lens, and I think they actually mesh quite well. I'm gonna beg for your indulgence at the beginning. I will be talking about human rights as noted in the introduction and the publicity, but as I was thinking about my remarks today and preparing for them, there, my mind has been a lot on um, what's going on in Turkey, Syria with the Kurds. And I was thinking a lot about that issue and broader foreign policy issues. So I have come up with a, a title for my talk. I'll be ever so slightly less diplomatic than Jim, who talks about a perhaps weakened relationship with the United Nations. And my title is uh, The United Nations in Tumultuous Times. So I see us living at a time where governing elites in regions and countries across the globe are disengaging from global institutions, whether we're looking at um, all of the controversy and conflict over Brexit, or whether we're looking at disengagement from diplomacy via the United Nations, failure to pay <coughs> UN assessments, and so on. There seems to be, uh, at least among some governing elites, a retreat from the institutions that help to create peace, prosperity, and stability in the period after World War II. And that is troubling for me, and I think for many of us. So I, I think of these times as tumultuous for foreign policy, and for that reason, the, the future of global institutions can sometimes seem uncertain. And so that's the frame the United Nations in tumultuous times. And I wanna begin with just some background information. Um, you know, I'm gonna make an argument, a sort of pragmatic argument for the United Nations that's between sort of despair and utopian idealism, which is where I think we exist in the real world, both today and historically. But in order to make that case, I wanna start with uh, a paradox and that's sort of reconciling the bad news with the good news. And I'm gonna start with the bad news. Um, and so many of you probably saw the article in the New York Times just a couple of days ago talking about the acute cash flow crisis that the United Nations is facing. So according to an article, this article, the UN is taking drastic steps to address this cash flow crisis, and it's due to member states' failure to pay their assessed contributions. Um, the UN is implementing austerity measures, including regulating how much heat and not, you know, everybody's gonna be turning the lights off for sure um, when they leave the building. And so a lot of sort of really basic things, but also expressing a lot of concerns about whether there's going to be funding for the travel for, conferences and for the, the spaces, the institutional spaces where a lot of the UN's work gets done. So Secretary General Antonio Guterres has described the situation as severe and has warned that the UN may not be able to meet payrolls or pay bills unless success contributions are made. So the United States is the largest contributor, assessed 22% of the UN's regular budget and typically around 28% of the peacekeeping budget the United States owes $675 million for the current year and $381 million for previous years. And other major debtor, country, debtor countries include Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Iran, Israel, and Venezuela. And the debt to the UN of these countries makes up 90% of the shortfall. So this is genuinely bad news. Um, one of the quotations at the end of the article I read was a question to 
a UN official asking about whether the UN was going to be able to sustain itself. And this person said at some point, if you can't pay the bills and pay staff, you have to ask questions about sustainability. Now, this is a, I'm not going to call this good news. I'll call this a transition to our good news. And that is we've been here before. Um, when I studied the United Nations in graduate school, you know, I remember regularly hearing about our $1.2 billion in arrears uh, to the United Nations. So this is a perennial problem. And the UN has managed to sustain itself through hard times before. But I do think these are genuinely tumultuous times. So what's the good news in this context? The good news, and, and I think there's many aspects of good news, but I'm going to focus on one piece in particular, and that is despite the sort of um, unwillingness of the U.S. government to pay its commitments to the United Nations in full and on time, we have really broad and strong support for the United Nations um, in the United States. And what I think is especially notable about this is that it's bipartisan. So this isn't um, one party supporting the UN and others not. So according to the Better World Campaign, 88% of US voters believe that it is important for the UN to maintain, for the United States to maintain an active role within the United Nations. In the most recent poll that they did, um, American support for the United Nations was at a 10 year high. It represents bipartisan support. So the most recent polling figures I saw say that seven out of 10 US voters support paying our dues to the UN in full and on time. And that figure includes 55% of Republicans, 78% of independents, and 84% of Democrats. A majority of young Americans have a favorable view of the UN and favor constructive US engagement with global institutions. So I think that's genuinely good news. Now, it's a paradox and a puzzle that we can have such strong, broad, bipartisan support for an institution that the government consistently doesn't pay our, our dues in full and on time. And, and, and we'll try to disentangle that puzzle a little bit as we go forward. But before we do that, I want to highlight other key features for the background of this conversation about what is good about the United Nations or what I think Americans of all parties and ideological stripes should value about the United Nations. Uh, the UN provides a truly good return on investment. And one of the things that the Better World Campaign highlights is that we, we gener the UN generates um, almost $2 billion in contracts for US companies and communities. Um, and so there's value in the UN economically for us, but I think the value that I also want to highlight, and maybe most importantly highlight, is the security benefits for us. That, that um, when I went with a, a delegation of students to the Global Leadership Summit in Washington, D.C., sponsored by the United Nations Association this summer, learning all about the United Nations and then going to our day on the Hill to have conversations with staff from congressional representation in Iowa, we heard support from across the aisle. So I distinctly remember a conversation I had with Nick Adams, whose staff, national security staff, in the office of Senator Ernst, um, and he was making a very strong argument for the United Nations in that um, the language that he used consistent, consistently was solving problems at their source and solving them with UN influence, which is much more cost effective, certainly in terms of treasure, but vastly so in terms of, of lives than allowing conflicts to escalate to the level where we have military involvement. And those kinds of conflicts are costly, of course, in dollars, but m most importantly, in human lives. So I have been hearing a great deal of bipartisan support talking about the UN as a mechanism by which we can achieve our security aims in a very cost-effective manner. And I think that's an argument that res resonates across the political aisle. 
The other thing I think that's really important to remember from a sort of background perspective is, you know, we throw around this language of return on investment, but what is the investment? So our contributions to um, international organizations, sort of, that, that's the, the um, primary umbrella for U.S. budget towards the U.N. and its specialized agencies. We're 1.4 billion in 2019. The Better World campaign is call, was calling for 1.5 billion, so there is a shortfall there. But whether we use the target, targeted full funding amount or the amount that was actually funded seems like a lot of money, but it's a small amount in comparison to what we spend on U.S. foreign assistance generally. So adding up all of our budgetary contributions, not only just to the CIO, the contributions to international organizations, but also voluntary contributions to peacekeeping missions and sustaining those peacekeeping missions, less than 20% of our foreign assistance typically goes towards the United Nations. More importantly, foreign assistance all told is a small percentage of US spending. So it's a very small percentage of our overall national budget, less than 1%. So I think those of us who are not living in extraordinary wealth hear a figure of 1.5 billion and say, ouch, that's a lot. When we think about the amount of money we're spending on everything as a country, it's a drop in the bucket. And it's an incredibly valuable investment in our security and I'll also argue, as I proceed through this talk, an incredibly important investment in our values. So we have a paradox, I'm suggesting, that we have really broad bipartisan support for the United Nations and its activities. We can make the case that there's great value in the UN, financially and from a security perspective. And yet we run into this perennial problem of resistance to funding the UN fully and on time. Um, one of the arguments that the Trump administration has been making recently, and it's not a new argument, other administrations and other, um, you know, this, this argument has been made in other periods of our history, but why do we have to pay such a, a big portion of the budget? Why are we assessed 22%? of the regular contributions. And we can have some conversation around that in the discussion. Um, I, I simply will say at this point that in a sort of return on investment framework, if we think about the investment that the, the United States has made militarily, this is a small, small fraction, and we are not having the cost in human lives in peacekeeping. Um, the other argument I will make in this regard is that there is cost sharing that in sort of sort of the human resource component, that when it comes to peacekeeping missions, it's countries, low-income countries, that are usually sending troops to serve as peacekeepers. So it's, it's um, vastly more complicated than the rhetoric of, you know, we just want other, other countries to share in the cost. Um, we, can, we can dig into that a little bit more in the question and answer period. Um, I want to make the case that the first step towards resolving the, the paradox of the gap between broad support for the UN and willingness to fund the UN in full is, is in the space of politics. When people are asked, they say they respond, or they, they respond favorably to the UN and its role. But we have to be willing to advocate actively and assertively for the importance of the UN's role. So as Iowans, I'll give you one concrete example. When you're participating in the caucuses, we should be asking all of the candidates what their position is on constructive US global engagement, what their position is relative to the United Nations, and we should be advocating for commitment at the outset in a proactive way, not just reacting every time an administration withholds dues and then sort of retroactively trying to pressure our government. We should make it a full frontal priority in our foreign policy and our politics. And to do that, we need to actively 
advocate. So here's, a, here's a me really wearing the executive director of the Iowa UNA hat for a moment. Um, I took uh, three students to the, U the Global Leadership Summit, as I mentioned, in June, sponsored by the United Nations Association. Uh, one of those students is involved with the University of Iowa chapter of the, of the United Nations. One of those students is one of the student leaders who's creating a United Nations Association chapter at Drake University. And the third student was my daughter, who I can really hold accountable to making sure that she's activist and advocating as she should be when she comes home, since I paid for her plane ticket. Um, so that's, those are seeds. These, they were all young women as it happens. They were amazing in these meetings with our congressional representation. And I'm imagining a future next year where it's not three students, but maybe 10. And hopefully some experienced UNA advocates. I saw a lot of people raising their hands about being leaders and members of Iowa UNA having some intergenerational wisdom as part of these delegations, but that we're building a movement that you can't ignore when it comes to issues of foreign policy. So that when a politician or a, a governing official reads a poll, that's of course one thing and it matters. But when you have a delegation of first three, then 10, then 30, then 50, showing up outside of your office, advocating for us to pay our dues in full and on time, sending letters, showing up at the town halls, showing up at your office, that's a, diff that's a movement. That's, just, that's not just political opinion in the abstract. So I think the missing piece is to translate broad public support into an active movement that shows up to do the work to really make sure that everyone hears the message about the importance of constructive US global engagement and the value of these global institutions. So why? Right now I'm just making a political argument. I'm, I've made some sort of brief arguments about the, the economic benefits and the security benefits, but I haven't really rooted my argument yet in substance um, on issues. And so I want to spend some time talking about the case for the United Nations in four areas. Um, I'm going to talk about global health. I want to talk about climate action. I want to talk about human rights. And I want to talk about peacekeeping. And I'm going to just make sort of um, a broad argument for what the UN has done and can do in each of these issue areas. But in doing that, I also want to highlight what the UN is actually in a position to do and what its limitations are. Because if we have the notion that the UN is this sort of monolithic governing body that's just going to do it without our work, we are really missing the point. Um, so the UN, the UN is an institution that I believe provides institutional space where governments can come together and proactively engage in diplomacy and collective problem solving in ways that are much more efficient and easier than bilateral negotiations. So we've got institutional space created. We should really value that. And it's also been an incredible incubator of ideas and global norms that changes the way we talk about global issues and that elevates critical global issues such as the ones I mentioned to the top of the policy agenda. But the UN is, as govern governing institutions go, at best a confederation. So it's not a world government and we can't expect it to operate as such. So we should look to the UN for institutional space for collective problem solving, for the creation of norms and the dissemination of norms, but it's up to citizens in every country to pressure their governments to take advantage of that space and to take those norms and to translate them into policy.
So let's talk about what that looks like briefly in um, the four different areas that I mentioned. Um, and I think when I do that, we'll probably bring us up around to the sort of Q&A time. I want to make sure we leave time for questions and answers. So the case I'm going to make in all of these areas that the UN operates in this space that's between utopian idealism and realist pessimism. Um, if you read the preamble to the United Nations Charter, which I'm sure many of you have, it says the UN is created to promote the well-being of all humans, to promote human rights, to prevent the scourge of war for all time. That's a pretty tall order, and that's really ambitious aspirational rhetoric. Those are the goals, but the reality is much more pragmatic. To the cynics who say the UN is nothing more than um, a sort of cynical space for powerful, gov powerful governments to play power politics, that misses the point, because that, that misses the actual historical record. So let's talk about what pragmatism between utopian idealism and realist pessimism looks like. Global health is the first place I'm going to start. So when I first started teaching at Drake University in 1995, I recall that the statistic that we regularly read about was that there were 12 million preventable 12 million childhood deaths from preventable diseases every year. That's horrific. Preventable illnesses, not accidental illnesses. We're talking about the kinds of things that access to adequate nutrition, clean water, vaccinations can address. And those deaths were happening because that access to the basic infrastructure for childhood health was not available. So... Now, that figure is down to 7 million preventable childhood deaths a year. That's still a horrific number. It's awful to contemplate that 7 million children die each year that wouldn't have to die if they had access to vaccinations, clean water, adequate nutrition. But the trend is something to hang on to as something quite positive. And the trend continues in a, down, in a downward direction. Those preventable childhood deaths are declining and continuing to decline despite the fact that we live in tumultuous times. Now, am I gonna stand up here and claim that the UN did this directly? Of course not. That would be an intellectually dishonest answer because the UN is not s staffing global health initiatives on the ground in countries across the world. But did the UN absolutely play a role in helping to coordinate global initiatives that contributed to this decline in preventable childhood deaths? It certainly did. So things like um, the Gavi Alliance vaccination initiative is something that the UN framework helped to coordinate and promote. The UN helps um, raise awareness about global health as a critical issue and to advocate on behalf of governments across the world funding initiatives intended to reduce childhood health. The World Health Organization plays a really critical role, not implementing health initiatives directly on the ground, but working with public health officials in countries across the globe to implement global health initiatives based on the most advanced and empirically grounded evidence about what works in global health. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, the role that the UN plays is agenda setting, raising the priority of global health on the political agenda, coordination, coordinating action, activities and actions between national governments, funding agencies, and non-governmental organizations that work on these issues. And it plays a really critical role as sort of a fulcrum around which these activities take place. And I firmly believe that we would not be living in a world where preventable childhood deaths have declined from 12 million to 7 million if we lived in a world without the United Nations.
So the UN plays a really critical role there. Um, the second example I wanted to um, put on the table, promoting climate action to address the climate crisis. Here's an area where I think there's some complexity and nuance. The United Nations and the Convention on, on um, the Climate has not directly been able to transform climate action in the world. So I think sometimes I, it's really easy for people who observe the United Nations and the UN framework of international law to feel discouraged because you read the law, the law says one thing, and the outcome is often disconnected from the legal norms. And I think that's a fair critique. It's one I encounter all of the time, whether we're talking about um, international law around envir the environment or international law around human rights. There can be an enormous gap between legal norms and outcomes. But the reality is that, again, the United Nations is not a world government. So it's really challenging to build in enforcement mechanisms into international law. Why? Because it's national governments themselves that are passing the laws and ratifying those laws. And if national government, governments deem those laws too threatening to their own sovereignty, they will not participate. So it's inevitable, whether we like it or not, that international law has to be a system of voluntary governmental involvement, or states will simply retreat from the system altogether. So the United Nations has not been able to, af to affect l international laws against climate change that it itself can enforce, but it has dramatically raised awareness of climate change as an issue. It has helped elevate the need for climate action to the top of the agenda. And we have to give enormous credit to the uh, youth movement for climate action and the climate strikes led, led by Greta Thunberg and youth activists all over the world for pushing this agenda harder and further. Um, those non-governmental non organizations and movements are essential but one of the things that I think is really interesting here, so Greta Thunberg came and spoke before the United Nations and had some harsh and justifiably angry words for the governing elites of the world. Um, and I can imagine hearing those words as a condemnation, not only of national governments that are failing the next generations, but also of the UN system for not effectively doing more. And yet I find myself saying, how interesting is it that these righteous youth critics are given space at the United Nations, even when they're being exceptionally critical over the organization? I think that is part of the UN's role, is creating institutional space. So absolutely 100%, Greta Thunberg is driving much of this youth activism. But the UN itself amplified her voice by giving her space. And so much media coverage generated by this, and even by accepting the understandable critiques of the limitations of working through these governing institutions. So I think that's incredibly valuable and important to remember. And here again, I would say if we back up from the issue and think about what it is that the UN is doing, it creates space to raise awareness to disseminate norms and for non-state actors to pressure national governments to take action. At the end of the day, we will not see action on the climate if national governments don't take it. It's up to the governments to make the policy changes. And if the United Nations can amplify the voices of social movements that are pressuring for such change, that's incredibly valuable. Human rights. So this one I'm going to have to be careful about because this is where I do much of my scholarship, and I'll make sure that I keep my remarks short enough to allow time for questions. <laughs> The, the thing that I will just highlight here, we could talk about a lot of things. 
There are lots of reasons to feel pessimistic about human rights globally. Um, we have had extraordinary achievements in the dissemination of international human rights law, and we could point to all sorts of human rights violations and deprivations across the globe that persist and persist and persist, despite advancements in international human rights norms. And one of the things, um, I gave a talk last year on the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and developed an insight that I'm a bit embarrassed to admit hadn't occurred to me before, but learning is a lifelong process. So I was grateful to have the insight. Um, went back and sort of studied. I had I studied the law and politics of human rights. I'd done a lot less reading in my career about the history of human rights because I'm not a historian. So last year in preparation for this talk, I read as much history as I could get my hands on. And one of the things that really surprised me was that human rights as a widespread, widely recognized concept didn't actually exist until the creation of the UN system. So we talk about natural rights, and certainly we can trace the evolution of the idea of human rights to natural rights. And at least based on the histories I read, we can point to isolated movements of you know, uh, Latin American lawyers advocating for what they called hum human rights, or droit, droit de l'homme, the rights of man, this sort of gendered conception of this a lot. But these were sort of pockets of movements and isolated movements. And in 1948, the General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Its creation was based on input from not only governing officials from all the regions of the world, but from non-governmental actors soliciting input from philosophers and novelists and artists. And so it was a much more broad-based system than a lot of people realize. We often hear the critique that the UDHR is a product of the West, and we can't ignore the role that Western governments played in shaping the UDHR. And at the same time, to accept that claim uncritically devalues the absolutely essential role that delegations from India, from Latin America, and from many non-Western regions played in pushing for human rights as something that would actually constrain great powers. And so it's a remarkable document. And remember, the concept of human rights did not exist broadly at the time. And in recent polling data, not only did the vast majority of people in the world, all regions of the world, recognize the concept of human rights, but there's widespread, strong majority support for the concept of human rights across the globe. That's actually a remarkable achievement. It's easy to focus on all of the failures and the, the challenges to upholding those rights, but I want to focus for a bit on the fact that the notion of rights exists. And you certainly can't act to promote human rights if you don't have a language that recognizes them as such. So I think it's a pretty important ac accomplishment. Four minutes to one. <laughs> Peacekeeping. Um, I, will, I could speak for probably hours about this. I will keep my remarks brief so we do have time for conversation. Peacekeeping is probably the UN activity that most people recognize. <clears throat> and it's remarkable that it was not written into the UN Charter. The UN Charter does not mention UN peacekeeping. Instead, the vision was that there would be peace enforcement where the Security Council could authorize international action to enforce the peace when countries violated or, or created threats to international peace and security. But because of the Cold War and the structure of the Security Council where the major powers have veto power, peace enforcement did not work as its proponents initially intended, or maybe it did, since it reflected sort of power and national interest of those major powers. But peacekeeping emerged as an innovation, and it's incredibly sophisticated diplomacy where you have the UN playing the role of facilitating 
elaborate ceasefires and peace agreements and navigating to have UN authorized peacekeeping troops on the ground to basically create a, a buffer zone between parties in conflict to create the conditions under which peace is more likely to emerge. And, and peacekeeping is invaluable. And even though it wasn't part of the original vision of the United Nations, it's an essential role, and it has saved countless, countless lives. And I'll, I'll end with just an example. I mentioned at the beginning that I was thinking about what's going on with the Kurds. And I was having a conversation with my students last week where they're asking me what the logic of the foreign policy was. And exactly. <laughs> and I really always try to sort of think about how people who have different points of view might see something. And I was really struggling to answer this question. And I'll be honest with you, I made a, a wisecrack about coming to this event to talk about foreign policy. And I said, you know, US foreign policy, question mark, there's my talk, I'm done. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I've been reading the news. And when I <clears throat> sort of followed that this could be, could be, through really awful and ugly means, the end of the Syrian conflict in Assad's favor. So in a way, a victory, I was thinking about this as, as a victory of literally strongman security. Erdogan, Assad, Putin, and at the expense of a lot of violence of the Kurds, that may not have been intentional, but maybe there's a logic to order that comes from violence playing out to its utmost extreme. But that is not a logic that I want to subscribe to. And if we have tools at our disposal where we could have engaged in vigorous diplomacy, utilizing the space of the United Nations to create a peacekeeping space, how many lives could have been saved? and will continue to be saved. And the longer term question for me, because I'm thinking about the foreign affairs and foreign policy aspect of this, and that many people are here thinking, perhaps not first and foremost globally, but about US national security, and thinking about our long term security interests, that when we engage in the foreign policy that we're engaging in now, we're not clearly thinking about the long-term consequences of, of this. Because people who experience extreme violence and betrayal and abandonment and repression of their rights are living in co contexts that are ripe for radicalization. And I'm thinking of the long view. And who are the security threats of the future? And what is the breeding ground for terrorism looking forward? And unfortunately, when we engage in a, a cynical foreign policy that doesn't prioritize global engagement and diplomacy, my deepest fear is that we're creating the conflicts for future generations. So to me, this is an example that highlights, in this case, what could have been um, in terms of the UN. So I think it's probably a good time to stop and allow some time for questions. All right, if you have written questions, wave your hands and our interns will bring them up. Uh, Jim Olson will be selecting uh, questions and, and reading them for answers. While that's going on, uh, I will remind you of our upcoming programs. Next week on Thursday, uh, October 24th, uh, we will get some answers to that perennial question, what should we know about Russia and its foreign policy from me, uh, actually. <laughs> Uh, and the following week on Wednesday, October 30th, Brenda Longfellow, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Iowa, will speak to us on Bread and Circuses, the Female Patrons of Ancient Pompeii.
So uh, let, let me say, first of all, while we're still collecting the cards, that uh, I've been a member of UNA for over 40 years, which I know is surprising to you because I'm so youthful. But, uh, <laughs> but I've heard a lot of, of UN Day presentations, and that was really tip-top. So thank you so much, Deb. And we've had some questions about uh, the 22% of the UN's regular budget that is donated by the UN. Uh, and so one of the questions is, uh, how does that compare with the share uh, of um, donations that are assessed to uh, EU nations? And I, I would all, I, I broaden that to include, um, if you could just put the US contribution in the context of other major contributors? You know, I, I don't actually know the percentage. I know that other, that, let me put it this this way, and if, if you want me to use time looking up the specific figures, I will. I think I'd rather answer the question generally because we can all look up the specific amount, but assessments are made based on ability to pay, so all wealthy countries pay more. So I think that the principle is the answer. The EU and the United States pay more than Botswana and Zimbabwe. Um, and I think the other logic of this that I would put on the table is remembering, although I somewhat challenged the sort of critique of the UN as and the UDHR is being criticized by Western countries. I think it's really important to remember that the UN was created um, largely with the influence of the United States and Europe after World War II. This was prior to decolonization. And so the UN's creators saw great value in the organization, and a third and related point is thinking about the fact that we also have disproportionate voice and influence, not in the General Assembly, but in the Security Council, that veto power that the United States and, and the other major powers have, um, I think warrants higher input. Whether or not everyone in this room thinks it's a good thing for the US to have veto power, that's a separate discussion, but we do. We are never going to be subject to Security Council action in the way that other countries are because we have disproportionate influence. So I think the case I'd make is that all of the major powers have a greater financial burden, but they also have disproportionate influence, largely because I think they have really clear benefits coming to them. So, okay. We can look up the specific numbers after if you want. So the next question is, what are the end goals of the current U.S. administration? Uh, what, what end goals is the current U.S. administration trying to achieve by delaying the payment of U.S. dues to the U.N.? I'm not sure there's an answer to that, but go ahead. I think you're asking the wrong person. Um, what are the end goals? I, I, you literally are probably asking the wrong person. But I think that first I do want to say, as much as it's easy to criticize the current administration, this is not a new phenomenon. This is a perennial phenomenon. We're not doing ourselves any political favors to pre pretend otherwise. So I would, I guess, if friendly reframing of the question, what is, what is the objective or end game of any sort of political actor that resists the, the payment of our dues in full and on time? It's a different worldview that I'm comfortable articulating. I think that if you look through um, the history of US funding or delays in funding of the United Nations, it is um, motivated a great deal by a preoccupation with U.S. So sovereignty and national interests narrowly defined. So it tends to be, that worldview tends to be put forward by people who do not share my perspective that 
cooperation gener generates explicit and concrete benefits for the U.S. They favor a go-it-alone approach so that, in their view, throwing money at global problems through the U.N. is a waste of money. Relatedly, one of the things that critics who op oppose sort of full funding of the U.N. say is that it's, it's inefficient. Um, and so talking about, for example, global conferences, the, the New York Times um, article I mentioned, um, if you're talking about conference perks and you're someone who opposes full funding of the United Nations, you might want to say, well, why do you need perks at conferences? These conferences are extravagant. They serve a sort of bureaucratic Democratic class. And so the critic is it, the criticism is about wasteful spending that in the view of those critics doesn't serve the US national interest. And then I think the third critique that is put forward is um, looking at times and places where the UN has failed. So an example would be the failure to stop genocide in Rwanda, and that being high, those sorts of, sort, I, I would say it's a limitation and not a failure. Now, my own response to this is that the UN didn't fail. The international system failed. The UN can only do as much as its member states and as, as its powerful member states empower it to do. So when the UN fails, that means that the US has failed, Russia has failed, Europe has failed. Um, the UN, as I said, is at best a weak confederal system. And so the UN's failures are the international state system's failures, in my view. But I think it's not so much an end game. The critique is that it's not a good use of our resources. That's, that's the critique that I think the Trump administration has and predecessors before it that did not fund the UN. We have time for one more. One more question. One more. OK, well, <clears throat> the last question uh, will actually draw upon your study of the history of human rights. And the question is, um, could you please tell us a bit about Eleanor Roosevelt's role in developing the concept of human rights? At what stage was she involved? I sure am glad I read those histories last year. <laughs> um, so Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the commission that drafted the document that became the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that document was first voted on by the Commission on Human Rights and then went forward to the General Assembly. So she played a really critical role in sort of navigating the, the political discussion and the politics of trying to craft a document that although we're not living in a world that's as diverse as it is today because the, the countries involved this happened prior to decolonization, but you still had um, delegates from China, from different parts of Latin America, from Lebanon, and she's from, from uh, the Soviet Union. She's navigating this vast ideological um, disagreement, political disagreement, different cultural and political systems. So she played a really critical role in in bringing these parties together. The other thing that I would highlight about her role that I think is really, really important in my mind is that one of the debates that happened in the um, negotiations and the creation of the UDHR was a debate be between people who favored making the document extremely legalistic, sort of hard law, that if we don't have a document that is seen as law that is meant to be adjudicated and enforced, then we're falling short. And those who saw that to try to create hard, hard law where there wasn't support for enforcement was only going to undermine the legitimacy and support of the document and instead favored a view where the UDHR was about solidifying the idea of human rights and creating norms and promoting culture. And Eleanor Roosevelt was on the side of making the case for the UDHR as a cultural and educational document. And to this day, I quote her and use her way of thinking about this as a call to action, that 
we fall far short if we think the, th this is all about passing laws at the level of the UN and then we get to go home and binge watch whatever the latest Netflix thing is and let you know, all of the UN people implement the law. That's not how it works. If we want change, we have to do the advocacy and the work. And I think her vision of human rights as something that had to take place in communities is, remains critical to this day. So, great. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that was great. Um, I want to uh, echo what Jim said about a really, really nice uh, presentation. Uh, let me briefly express again our gratitude to our sponsors University of Iowa's Honors Program, UI Public Policy Center, the UI International Programs, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And also today's special sponsors Allison Ken Atkinson, Mason K. Braverman, Green State Credit Union, and thanks to City Channel 4 very much. Uh, Deborah, as a small token of our appreciation, I'm I'm pleased to present to you what we like to call the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. <laughs> so, there you Thank are. you. Thank you. I drink a lot of coffee, so this is fantastic. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We are adjourned. <laughs>